Are miracles possible in the physical universe, or are they impossible because they would violate the laws of nature? Many argue miracles can never happen, and have never happened, because the laws of nature prohibit miracles from occurring. The philosopher David Hume was said to have settled this centuries ago in his essay of Miracles, where he taught, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle, from the very nature of the fact, is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. It is a miracle that a dead man should come to life, because that has never been observed in any age or country. There must therefore be uniform experience against every miraculous event, otherwise the event would not merit the appellation. So basically he says, because miracles violate the laws of nature, and because the experience of ordinary history confirms this principle, therefore, because miracles are outside of our experience, which establishes the laws of nature, they are impossible. But if you look closely, you'll see there are numerous problems with this line of reasoning. First is the idea of how Hume establishes the laws of nature, through unalterable experience. However, Hume, and others like him, haven't evaluated all of human experience. They have merely evaluated their own experience of the world. In addition, one has to realize that humanity has not yet seen everything there is to see, nor solved the vast mysteries of the universe. So you can't say your experience establishes unalterable laws. So you can't make an immutable law of nature just from your experience of what you've observed. Uh, that is not logically possible. So how could Hume say that his experience excludes the possibility of miracles, especially when not everyone agrees with him? If human experience, which includes all humans, establishes the laws of nature and establishes they cannot be violated, then how do we account for people who report miracles in their experience? How can Hume say a dead man rising has never been observed in any age or country if people have reported this event and do not share his experience? Their uniform experience contradicts Hume's, and therefore all of human experience doesn't establish miracles can never happen. In fact, polls across the globe suggest that one third of all people have had a spiritual experience, and therefore human experience has not established that miracles can never happen, unless you do as Hume did and assume all reports of miracles are lies in order to say miracles do not happen. But that would be arguing in a circle. As C.S. Lewis said, we must agree with Hume that if there is absolutely uniform experience against miracles, if in other words, they have never happened, why then they never have. Unfortunately, we know the experience against them to be uniform only if we know all reports of them are false. And we can know all reports to be false only if we know already that miracles have never occurred. In fact, we are arguing in a circle. This is why atheist John Ehrman wrote a short book called Hume's Abject Failure, where he boldly opens with, Section 10 of Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding is a failure. He shows with Bayes' theorem that Hume's argument doesn't work. Hume is simply presupposing miracles cannot happen in order to say miracles cannot happen. The argument is an abject failure. One of the points he brings up is the fact that contemporaries of Hume responded to him with the example of a prince from a tropical climate who has never seen ice. By Hume's logic, he is correct in believing there is no such thing as ice from just hearing reports of its existence, since that would be extraordinary by his experience alone, and thus he could say it is impossible for ice to exist. Hume's only response to this was to claim that ice was not outside of all human experience, but Ehrman responds to this attempt by pointing out there was a time when all human experience was limited to a small group that arose in Africa, and no one had experienced ice then. So by Hume's logic, ice would violate a natural law since it was beyond uniform human experience at that time. And this is the exact same problem one has when they apply Hume's reasoning to reports of miracles. If you say miracles cannot happen because uniform human experience excludes miracles, and you exclude all reports of miracles as false because you know miracles do not happen, then you are just arguing in a circle. In doing so, one starts with a belief that miracles do not happen and jumps to the conclusion that miracles do not happen. But what about Hume's second part? where he says that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle, unless the testimony be of such kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. In other words, the miracle itself must be more probable than if the person was lying who's reporting it. Well, obviously. One needs to evaluate the evidence for the specific miracle claim and weigh the options to see if the evidence favors its truth or falsehood, not dismiss it outright from a philosophical presupposition. Hume has said nothing the theist would reject. As John Ehrman says, all the parties on the opposite side of Hume in the 18th century debate on miracles knew that miracle claims could not be established without the help of very strong evidence. In some cases, they thought they had produced the required evidence. Perhaps they were wrong, 
But to show that they were wrong takes more than solemnly uttered platitudes. When it comes to the resurrection, for example, Christians will argue it is more likely the event happened over the possibility the apostles lied. For Hume to say this is not at odds with what Christians argue. In other words, Hume has said nothing really profound, but an obvious point of agreement on both sides of the aisle. Another error is how Hume defines a miracle as a violation of natural law. This is extremely odd for two reasons. First being that theists have defined miracles long before Hume ever came onto the scene, and no one ever agreed that Hume's definition was the universally accepted definition. Long before Hume, Thomas Aquinas pointed out a miracle is an event beyond the powers of the natural order, not a violation of the natural order. Right before Hume, Samuel Clark rightly pointed out a miracle is best defined as an effect produced contrary to the usual course or order of nature by the unusual interposition of some intelligent being superior to men. This traditional understanding of a miracle better captures what a miracle is, because a miracle is when an agent outside of the natural world inserts or changes something in the system the natural world could not bring about through its own regularity. The laws of nature are only meant to describe the effects of how natural things operate if left untouched. But that means natural laws do not exclude the possibility that an outside agent could change or feed something new into the system. And then of course the laws of nature can then describe what takes place after the fact. If you turn water into wine, then if you drink too much of it, it will intoxicate you according to the normal law of nature. But the laws of nature cannot forbid God feeding a new event into nature. After all, the laws of nature cannot prevent God creating the whole thing in the first place with the regularities that science has observed. This is why the philosopher Keith Ward says, the notion of an event beyond the natural powers of objects is more satisfactory than Hume's idea of a violation of a law since it does not carry the connotation of arbitrary interference, but rather a temporary elevation of powers beyond the natural. C.S. Lewis also explains why Hume's definition of a miracle is not adequate with our understanding of natural laws. If this week I put a thousand pounds in the drawer of my desk, and two thousand the next week, and another thousand the week thereafter, the laws of arithmetic allow me to predict that the next time I come to my drawer, I shall find four thousand pounds. But suppose when I next open the drawer, I find only 1,000 pounds. What shall I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken? Certainly not. I might more reasonably conclude that some thief has broken the laws of the state and stolen 3,000 pounds out of my drawer. Furthermore, it would be ludicrous to claim that the laws of arithmetic made it impossible to believe in the existence of such a thief or the possibility of his intervention. On the contrary, it is the normal workings of those laws that have exposed the existence and activity of the thief. Through this analogy, we can see a miracle doesn't violate any natural law. It only is evidence of an outside agent changing something or interfering with the system that the laws of nature would describe had normal operations taken place. But they are not violated since something natural doesn't cause the effect, but something beyond the natural operations. The second problem with Hume's definition is how natural laws are actually viewed. If miracles are a violation of natural laws, there is really no way they can violate natural laws according to the main theories of what natural laws are. None of them contradict the existence of miracles. The first is the regularity theory, which says that natural laws are not really laws, but generalized descriptions of the way things naturally happen in the world. On this view, no event can violate a natural law because they are only generalized descriptions of what occurs in nature, but not preventing causes from outside the system. The second is the gnomic necessity theory, which says natural laws are laws about what things in the natural world can and cannot do on their own. On this definition of natural laws, miracles would be seen as naturally impossible events, or in other words, events that cannot be produced by natural causes. But if something is fed into the system from an outside agent, then a miracle is not produced by the normal regularities of nature, and therefore a miracle would not violate any law of nature since the event's origin is not from within nature, and this theory only says what natural things can and cannot do on their own. The third theory is called the causal dispositions theory, which says that natural laws are metaphysically necessary truths about what causal dispositions are possessed by various natural kinds of things. So for example with this theory, a natural law would state, water has a disposition at sea level to freeze in sub-zero temperatures, 
If an outside agent prevents water from freezing at negative 10 degrees, the natural law is not violated because it would still be true, naturally speaking, that water would still have such a disposition when it is not interfered with. A miracle in this theory would be an event from causal interference with a natural propensity from an outside agent, but that would not remove its natural disposition. In a similar way, if I were to prevent the water from freezing by keeping it in motion, that would also not mean the disposition of water has been violated, just that an outside agent is interfering. So with any of the main theories, miracles do not violate natural laws, and Hume's definition is inadequate. The traditional definition better fits with the description of a miracle and how natural laws are defined. More importantly than all this is how modern science doesn't prohibit miracles. It was once thought the universe was set up with deterministic laws that could not be violated. But since the advent of quantum mechanics, we now know the universe is probabilistic, not deterministic. In other words, the laws of nature are only approximations of what will most likely happen. But according to quantum theory, irregularities are allowed at the far end of the probability bell curve. Deviations from the ordinary workings of nature are permitted. They are just very highly improbable and would rarely occur. As Dr. Mark Worthing says, Science, at least to the extent that it is influenced by quantum mechanics, is no longer so certain as to what can and cannot happen. So most things will fall within the general range of everything that happens, but then very strange events are actually permitted within the quantum world. Uh, if, for instance, that table would be permitted to just start floating without violating any laws of nature, but it's very, 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 very improbable. <laughs> that that will happen. But there's a difference between improbability and uh, violating a law of nature. And so that's the, the difference we're trying to emphasize here is when the laws of nature become statistical, you have that space at the end of the bell curve that's, uh, that's open for very strange things. So there is nothing impossible according to the quantum nature of the universe for natural anomalies to exist as possibilities. That would be perfectly consistent with natural laws, and no violation would have to happen if God wanted to use one of these opportunities, although very rarely, to do extraordinary things. Keith Ward explains it like this, God may work within the probabilistic structure of the physical laws to select a set of path which would not necessarily have been eventuated by physical laws alone, though the possibility of such a path exists in the natural world. Thus God can act within the natural world, intentionally bringing about a particular future. If God exercises selectivity at all times, the laws of probability would change. So if the laws of probability are to remain the same, God cannot so choose as to make physically less probable states happen continually, or even very often. From this, it immediately follows that if God is to leave the structure of the physical law intact, he cannot cause the unlikely to happen very often, though he could do so sometimes. Thus, even scientifically speaking, there is nothing that violates a natural law in causing a miraculous event. They are extremely improbable and would not happen on their own in a thousand lifetimes, but still possible within the quantum nature of the universe. And God could act on these possibilities if he wished so. Now regardless of this, there will still be some skeptics who wish to do as Hume did and simply define miracles out of existence and then boldly declare they cannot happen. That is their right, but as we have shown, these types of arguments are not logically necessary or convincing. There is not really much you can say to skeptics like this, so although nothing in this video tries to prove miracles have happened, if we're going to be fair and employ methodological neutrality, there is nothing logically or physically impossible about a miracle happening, and they are in no way a violation of a natural law.